So welcome everyone. And um, so we're gonna look at, we're really focusing on color space and RGB laser projection specifically. Uh, just trying to give a, a good background. And we're gonna be covering a uh, variety of topics. Uh, you know, how do we see color? What is color? What is white? And RGB illumination projectors and, yeah, and how are they really different? Because a lot of people are very confused on the word laser has been a over, overused term. So I want to explain that and, and try to clarify some things. And then overall, how does illumination affect color and brightness? But first, I'm going to set up just some context. How do we perceive light and color? So just focusing right now on shading. This is a fairly uh, famous optical illusion. It's usually billed as. I think it's very illustrative on how our brains actually uh, interpret things. So if you look at the A square and the B square, uh, I think everyone sees it as the A square and the B square are different colors or different shades, but the reality is they're all, they're identical in color and shading. Uh, it just our brains tell us there's a shadow being cast, and it tricks our brain. Same, same type of thing is very similar in color. So if you look at this cube, uh, you'll see lots of different colors on all the the three surfaces that you can see, but you see a brown square in the top center, and you see an orange square on the front on the front center, but when you actually look at those, you discover that they're actually exactly the same color. And I'll go back and forth a couple times so you can see that they're not, I'm not changing the colors, but your brain puts it together as orange, interprets it as orange or black, depending on, or orange or brown, depending on what's going on. So it just, that, it's a really important part of understanding things. And here, here's another good example. So as you're looking at this, you know, you're probably on a monitor, you may be fairly close to it, so it may not be as easy as, uh, as if you're in a larger venue where it's a little further away, but most people see like orangey uh, rust colored balls and purplish balls and, and green balls. But as you get closer and closer, you realize the balls are actually identical in color. It's really the lines over the balls that trick the brain into seeing different colors of the balls. And so just part of part of the confusion about color. So just a little bit about uh, color itself. I mean, uh, it's there's two different methods typically done where it's red, green, and blue uh, for light. And that makes up our primary colors. And the other is called subtractive color, additive color versus subtractive. And subtractive is CMYK, which is typically the printing process. So most color printers, I, matter of fact, I think all color printers use a cyan, a magenta, and a yellow ink, to, and maybe a black, uh, to make those different colors. You'll notice that the, uh, the colors in between are actually the blue, the green, and the red, where they mix together. What's interesting about the CMYK, when we were growing up, at least I was, and probably most people when they were in elementary school, we were taught the primary colors were blue, red, and yellow. And when I moved into light, it's it's red, green, and blue. And it's like, well, wait, wait how is it blue, you know, blue, red, and yellow? Well, if you are trying to explain the cyan color to people, you would say, most people would say, well, that's kind of a blue color. And the magenta is kind of a red color, and the yellow is yellow. And so it was described as uh, as red, blue, and yellow, but it's actually cyan, magenta, and yellow. So color has been represented on a wheel, and that's the most common uh, way of showing things, where you have primary colors and secondary colors and intermediate and tertiary, and there's complementary colors and all this stuff. But uh, the reality is, you know, when you look at color, it's actually not that way. So here's a um, Here's, I took a photospectrometer outdoors and I, I captured some sunlight reflected off a white piece of paper. And this is what I, I got. And this is a photospectrometer that reads only visible light. So it doesn't read infrared, it doesn't read ultraviolet, but it does read the visible spectrum. And it shows the full spectrum of light, but you'll notice there is no white. So if we actually take a even a broader step back and we look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum from everywhere from gamma rays to long radio waves and everything in between, these are all uh, just w waves of, of, of particles and, and things. But the visible light, what we call visible light, is what our eyes are actually set up to see, even though some animals see UV and IR. Humans only see in that narrow range. But again, there's no color white. 
So back in 1931, they were trying to decide or trying to figure out how to capture, how to study how much human eyes see. And they created the CIE 19, 1931 chart. And actually, if you look at the, uh, there's an X, a small X and a small Y on this chart and all numbers that are shown like 3127, 3290, 3140, 3510, those numbers are just an XY plot. So you can plot any color based on its XY coordinates. And that's really what those numbers, if you see uh, 3127 and 3290, that's what that means. But I wanna focus a little bit on the Plakian locus. It's this line that most people may have seen but not even understood or didn't even realize what it is. And uh, you know, we have just today we've defined white as a certain way uh, for video. Uh, now, cinema has its own variant of that. They have cinema white, which is a slightly warmer white. And it's all perceived of as white. And what's interesting about the way you see things, there is, um, you know, the, a white cotton sheet outdoors on an overcast day gets us to what's called D65 or D6500, uh, which is the color of white. And but when we were heating things up uh, back in the old days, when a blacksmith was uh, heating things up in a furnace, there would have been metal that's quote white hot. Well, the reality is it wasn't really white hot, but our eyes perceived it as white, and that's actually on that curve. And I have a television that actually uh, I, I put my meter on my TV, and it actually is uh, like eleven thousand Kelvin. It's it's very very blue, relatively speaking. But our, my brain doesn't see it as blue. My brain actually sees it as white. So, you know, there's been a lot of question like, what is the correct color of white? And so that's why if you look at LED bulbs, there's, you know, D65, there's 2700, 5000, there's 3000, Kelvin 9300. There's all these different whites. And as long as it's on that curve, we perceive it as white, although some are definitely warmer, some are definitely cooler, warmer being towards red and blue being on the cooler side. But there's also, if you, we've also been trying to define color for years. So the older terms of NTSC or PAL or CCAM or EGA, CGA, VGA, pointers gamut, et cetera, won't read the whole list, but there's been a lot of different interpretations on try to quantify color and try to standardize color. And uh, so we've moved beyond what some of those older standards are, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I wanna talk a little bit about photopic response. This is the human eye. The cones are the part of the eye that sees color. Rods see brightness, cones see color. But you'll notice that there's a red cone and a green cone and a blue cone. And if you look at the red cone, it actually intersects red, green, and blue. And the green intersects red, green, and blue as well. Blue only gets really into the, the blue and the green zone. It doesn't get into the red. But the point is it's not a hard fixed, uh, fixed point. Humans, men and women, also see color a little bit differently. There is slightly different uh, because of uh, estrogen levels or something. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but there are differences in the way men and women see things. And uh, that's why people sometimes disagree on what color something is. So, but it's a really important thing to understand is that people do see things a little bit differently. So looking at color, color volume. So there's that same horseshoe shaped object, which is the CIE color chart, uh, but with three different triangles uh, overlapping on that. The REC 709 triangle is the most commonly used standard today. And that is the, um, that, that is the smaller of the, sort of the pinkish triangle on the inside. <clears throat> DCIP3 refers to the digital cinema initiative color space that's used in movie theaters. And it has a lot more green, a lot more red, and a little bit more blue, but it has a, a bigger color volume. <clears throat> when you look at REC 2020, which is the current standard, again, it still doesn't represent everything we see as humans, but it's a much, it covers much more of that, of that area with the triangle. And the REC 2020 color volume is much greater. So unfortunately, I'm trying to describe things like if you were on the fourth dimension or if I was in the fourth dimension trying to explain things to you in the third dimension, it's one of those things that's really difficult. You're looking at a monitor, chances are on your laptop, more almost certainly it is a uh, a laptop that is REC 7 or 9 standard. So it doesn't have the ability of really showing you a REC 2020 image. So we've kind of 
done some artwork to sort of represent what you see. And you can see the REC 2020 parrot uh, or macaw is a much more saturated color. That's the kind of effect you get only when you actually see this with projection and you actually see REC 2020, you'll see that the color is much more vibrant. And so that's, that's an important thing to, uh, to understand. So illumination technology in, in the past, whether it was, you know, back in movie film days, uh, we had lamps and they were, they could have been mercury or xenon or mercury or halide or all these different lamp technologies that basically lit up or just even incandescent that lit up the projector. So those were what was inside of the projectors that, that illuminated either the film or the DLP or the LCD or whatever, whatever the, uh, the, the projection technology is, there was a lamp that, that made things glow. Since then, we've developed laser phosphor. Laser phosphor basically takes a blue laser and it it makes it turns that into a yellow light, and I'll explain a little more of that. But the color space of laser phosphor does not have anywhere near the same color space as a pure RGB laser. So the column on the right is really focused about RGB and it's a, it, it really is the one that allows us to approach full REC 2020 compliance or even beyond REC 2020 compliance as far as color volume. We can actually illuminate a lot more than just the industry standard. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So one of the first and, and very important things I wanna get across, a lot of people are confused with lasers. And so, uh, a laser illuminated projector is very different than a laser projector. Uh, a, a, a laser illuminated projector means we've replaced the light bulb, if you will, or the lamp. We've replaced that with a laser uh, illumination system. A direct laser projection system, like what came out in the 70s, uh, Laserium was the first to really uh, do this in the Griffith Planetarium back in 73, I believe. Uh, but direct laser shows uh, use direct beams, and they may have mirrors that that are moving those beams around, but that beam stays collimated, stays focused all throughout the entire uh, the entire time. When you look at so when you look at those images, they're nice vibrant colors because you can have those beautiful rich colors, but they're just single points. They're not really for photographic uh, type reproduction. Whereas a, a laser illuminated projector has all the features of a projector that allows the digital projection to really exist. Only now, instead of it being lit up by a lamp, it's being lit up by a laser system. So are all laser illuminated projectors the same? People hear the word laser and they assume, oh, it's the same thing. A laser phosphor projector is really not close to being equal to a RGB laser system. And the reason why is because when you look at a laser phosphor, what you're doing is you're having a blue laser hitting a phosphor wheel and that phosphor wheel glows yellow. And if we remember back, remember back to the uh, components uh, of the CMYK uh, and the RGB, uh, you take yellow and you split that into its primary components that make yellow in light and you get both red and green. So now you add another blue diode and you get red, green, and blue. What you're getting is not the best quality red or the best quality green. Uh, and the blue may not always be optimal either. There's different frequencies of blue. Some are more purple, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look at an RGB laser system, you're really illuminating the projector using RGB lasers. It goes in the projector, still goes in the integrator rod. If you notice that both of them from the integrator rod forward are the same, but now what you get is a much broader spectrum light that you're working with. So just looking at lamps, this is a mercury illumination. And I want, I want to point out that if you look at the red, it looks like there's a lot of red and the red does go fairly far out in the spectrum, but it's not very strong in the red. And I'll explain why that is really relevant in a little bit, but lamps put out all these, the various spectrum and different lamps have different, different spectral qualities. That's why Xenon is used, was used in movie theaters or still is used in movie theaters because it has a better color space than like a mercury illumination. Every, every place has their own, has their own requirement. But if you look at laser phosphor, now you'll notice there's a red spike on this. The reason why there's a red spike on this, we've added to a lot of our laser phosphor projectors at Christie, we've added what's called bold color. Bold color gives us a boost of, of red to really make up uh, for the deficient red that you'll see there. So if you look, there's a blue spike. There's also a green hump. 
and there's a little hump more in the in the orange range. That orange range is really all the red there is, and that's really a Rec 7 or 9 kind of red. So what we did is we added an, an extra red laser diode to boost that, that color to get a much better color spectrum. So if we look at our RGB 3P, a 3P laser system is a, there's a red, green, and blue spike, and there is and each one of those is the actual spectrum of the laser. You'll notice that the red is much taller than the green and the blue in this example, and the reason why the red is pretty far up in the spectrum. And if we we go back to the photopic response chart, you'll notice that the as you go farther and farther towards the uh, above 700 you'll you, you have less sensitivity to that amount of light so to make up to make this a white light you have to have the same amounts of red green and blue at least the same amounts of light that we see as at bal all balanced out but the reality is we're adding a lot more red which adds a lot more energy so even though we can't see it there's still a lot more energy entering the projector so the projector then takes that uh, and we, on our eyes, balance that out, and that's part of the, the balancing process. So metamerism or metamerism or metamer metameric failure, uh, there's a number of different ways of describing it. Now, again, this is another one of those uh, fourth dimension trying to explain things, because obviously you're looking at a single screen, you're not comparing one to another, but I've sort of baked it, I made a little graphic that sort of shows uh, how metameric uh, failure could occur. Uh, if you have different lamp illumination or different illumination technologies, you might see, according to a meter, they may be exactly matched on white. Those two colors may be exactly right. But when you compare them side by side, you may say, well, that one's a little more red and that one's a little more blue. And I've been in a, I, I've, I've actually experienced this with a, a number of people who are really experienced projectionists. And we set up two projectors, one with a xenon, one with an RGB. And about 70% of the people said, no, that one's the red one, that one's the blue one. And the other 30% said, no, 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 that one's the red one, that one's the blue one. So it's all the way people see things. And what, what that really tells you, our eyes adapt just the way we saw the color example at the beginning where we saw orange or we saw brown, depending on, on what the lighting was, or it really was all brown. Um, your, your eyes will adapt to see the same color. However, the important thing to understand here is you want, you want to use the same type of illumination on all your projection surfaces if you're doing a projection array, so you don't see different colors. So let's look at this as a, you know, color has really been represented as a two-dimensional thing, but the reality is, is a three-dimensional volume. And depending on, uh, on, on those colors, you can actually see that there's a lot more volume in the color space even though it may overlay in a two-dimensional world it may overlay in a three-dimensional world you can discover that there there's areas that are there's colors that you may not be able to hit at the same time because of other overwhelming other, other overwhelming pieces like sky blue may be clearly right in the in the color triangle but when you have a certain color volume you may or may not be able to represent that blue properly as blue. It may come out as gray based on our eyes. But when you have more color volume to work with, you can actually see a lot more. So I'm going to diverge a little bit onto contrast. And you know, this is another one of those things that it's much better to show you on, this on a projection system than on, a, on your laptop. But if you were looking at a, at a projected surface, chances are that screen is white or off-white, but we'll just call it white for a moment and you would project this exact slide onto a, onto a screen, and the text would actually be white. Well, it's really, it's perceived of as black, but it's only because the contrast of the surrounding area is much brighter, it, which gives us the illusion that there's darkness in, in the uh, screen. But if you actually look at that screen, it's still a white screen. So contrast is, a, is kind of a funny thing. Now, our eyes are phenomenal at adapting to different illumination levels. So you can see from bright sunlight, which is you know tremendously powerful, all the way down to you know a night sky with no moon or a quarter lit moon where there's just you know very, very low illumination levels. And our eyes manage to adapt to all that. So we can actually see many more times the, the range of, of contrast, but not always at the same time. The contrast really matters, and it's really about image quality. 
and it, it's contrast and also when you add color volume and everything else that's where it really starts to have that dimensionality to it a lot of people think it actually looks kind of 3d i'll take a little little detour why do pirates wear eye patches so i was at a conference uh and the reason why is because uh pirates it is believed needed to be able to dark adjust very quickly when they went below deck. Uh, specifically, a, a colleague uh, pointed out at a trade at a, at a conference that I was uh, speaking at that it's actually even more than just what going below deck. It's really going into the powder room. The powder room is a place where you keep the gunpowder, and of course, you don't want to walk in with a torch under in in your ship with a uh, an unopened torch. But back in the back in the day, they didn't have flashlights and didn't have internal illumination so you have to be able to have one eye that can very quickly adapt to the darkness to be able to restock your your gunpowder so the mythbusters did find that to be quite plausible even though we don't have any hard evidence that that's what it was so hdr hdr is unfortunately a very overused and misunderstood term everything that's hdr 10 compliant meaning it's an hdr 10 signal uh that is hdr uh, people call that HDR. Well, what really is HDR, and there's also been HDR photography, which has a different kind of look, but when you look at real HDR, you really are looking at incredible brightness and infinite contrast, or not infinite, but extreme contrast between everything and also extraordinarily uh, more rich color because you can actually show more. So you can have better specular highlights. You can see a lot more details, like in the glint of the eye. It just looks much more realistic. So if you look at this example of an engine, you look at the engine and say, okay, well, that, that's an engine. But when you look at this, when it, when you see the animation happening, you can see that it starts to look much more like a photograph or much more like you're actually there, like you're really looking at it. So this is just another one of those, it's a subtle detail, but it really brings out extra, extra enhancement and more realism. And here's another one. Uh, if you look at the Corvette and you look at the headlights or the, or the rims, they also glint a lot more. So bit depth, bit depth is very, very important, especially as we get into higher color volume, bit depth is a very, very critical piece of the, of the equation. So if you, uh, if you have low bit depth, what that means, you have fewer steps between one to the next. So as you have more color to work with, it's more important to have more color volume. Same with contrast, you have to have at least 10 bits to have a nice smooth gradient. If you have less than that, that you're going to start seeing posterization or banding, which is what you're seeing on those other two images. So pure laser RGB projection gives you the purest color. It's the most expansive color gamut, and it really allows you to do things like hit those very specific IP, like if you're doing Spider-Man or Coca-Cola red, and you're looking for something that is absolutely a very specific red. There's the only way to do that is with a broader color space, whether it's Rec 2020 or beyond Rec 2020. So these are all really important things to, to keep in mind. So with laser, we have an opportunity of, of covering a huge uh, range of brightness. And that's also a very important thing where lamps, there's only so much lamp power you can pump into a, into a projector. A laser projector, you can actually pump a lot more light into it. So just a, a little bit of a side note, it's really part of another presentation talking about uh, frame rate and other things, but I just wanna point out the cones and rods are also concentrated in the eye differently. So the way we see color is also not totally uniform around our eyes as well. So that's just another one of those things. Color space, uh, you know, once you see it, you really can't go back. Uh, when, when you see it side by side, and we've done these demonstrations where we have multiple projectors, at least two, and we swipe back and forth or we have them side by side with the same content, but mastered in each format, the, the color difference is day and night. It's, it's dramatic and you can't really unsee it. So, you know, we're, <clears throat> these are just some of our pure RGB laser projectors that Christy makes today. We've actually been making RGB laser projectors since uh, 2012. And uh, so we're on our second or third generation of, of laser RGB systems. And um, these aren't, the laser phosphor systems, although we do make an, uh, quite a few laser phosphor projectors, these are the pure laser RGB systems and we make them for, for cinema and non-cinema applications, various things. Here's one good example, the Alwasal Dome. This has 250 of our D4K40 RGB projectors. This is 
lit up, blended, warped with our Christie Mystique technology, but this is all warped together into one giant, uh, giant seamless image. And it is absolutely spectacular and the photographs really don't do it justice. It's one of those things hopefully we'll all get to see, I believe in 2021 now. So one of the other advantages of an RGB laser system <clears throat> is the stability over time. Unlike a lamp that degrades in, in a matter of you know, hundreds of hours, lasers are tens of thousands of hours. So it's a very slow degradation curve. And we're, because we're not using a phosphor that, that can degrade, this is a pure RGB, which maintains that color space. And that's really, really important over a very long period of time. And that curve will flatten out if you drive it a little bit less, it'll last a little longer. So uh, but we're, we have great confidence. We have systems been running for many, many years and, and the 30,000 hours, 80% brightness seems to be a very uh, achievable or what, what we've been able to accomplish and, and beyond. We have systems running for 35, 40,000 hours at this point. So great. Uh, one other option we have is because of RGB laser projection, we also have the ability of putting in high co higher contrast lenses, ultra high contrast lenses that give us 5,000 or 6,000 or, or more to one contrast. You lose some brightness in that in that process, but you do get better contrast, and that's something that's also a, a nice advantage. So, a little side note: uh, we have a product called the Christie Eclipse, which we announced last year. Uh, very exciting product for us. It really is unlike any other product on the market. It's capable of up to 20,000, excuse me, 20 million to one contrast, not 20,000, 20 million to one contrast, and it does that. You obviously have to have a very light controlled space to take advantage of all that still doesn't represent what we see as human beings, but it's much closer. It gives us much more contrast to work with. And where, where black is truly black, where you're not getting that residual level. And why does that matter? So if this was the image you're trying to project, but you're doing with an array of projectors, now you have these stripes where you'll have an overlap of 2x, meaning the ambient, you can only make the projector go as black as it can. Well, now we have that gray level, elevated 2x or 4x in the middle, or it might be 3x or 5x, depending on the system design. Uh, I'm just giving an example of four, where you your contrast, either you elevate the black levels or you add filters to try to block the light and everything else. But you know, fortunately, we installed uh, six of these Christie Eclipse projectors at the American Natural History Museum in New York City uh, last year. And uh, very exciting. Uh, very exciting result. Uh, the Carter Emhart, the uh, museum visualization director, is just beyond thrilled because now they have, they actually created a new show with the new projectors specifically because they could now take advantage of all of this extra contrast and color. So the show is built in Rec 2020 color and with the contrast range, allow you to get the super fine details at you know level one, level two, just really, really spectacular. So what, are, what does all this mean? Well, we're actually facilitating illusionists because our customers are all really illusionists. They create these images to make you feel like you're somewhere else and, and do all that. So we're trying to create reality. And yes, our eyes can adapt. And we've I, I showed you those examples at the beginning where you have uh, optical illusions that, that fool your eye. But the reality is our eyes are actually capable of seeing a lot more. And the more real, realistic that you get, better that the impression is going to be. So it really helps. And there's a lot of factors. It's not just color. It's not just brightness. It's also going to be, you know, uh, resolution, frame rate. Uh, there, there's viewing distance. There's camera movement. There's all sorts of things that all play into this. So the important thing is RGB laser illumination really is the pinnacle. It really enables you to do, do things and tell stories like never before. <clears throat> 